morning, ladies, gentlemen, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Epic Film Guys podcast. Justin, the live stream for The Cure is a mere two weeks away tomorrow, as of release day, as of release day, May 18th through the 20th. We're going to talk about that very, very soon, but I, of course, am Nick. And I'm Justin, and that's right, Nick. We're super close to the live stream for the Cure 2.0. You got over that 2.0 because we did gotta one last in year, there, baby. Got to get and it, it was in a, there. It was a great time last year. I'm really looking forward to the event. We have a lot of awesome surprises in store for all of our listeners out there and everyone interested in the live stream. And we do have uh, some early donations that we've gotten in the past couple of days, which I'm sure you'll get to in a few moments here. But can't be- can't believe it. Um, really excited about it. I think we have raised just about $300 so far in early donations when you count merchandise sales as well over on Redbubble. Again, anything branded with that live stream for the Cure logo, anything, all profits go to the live stream for the Cure. It works out to $6.50 per item. So get over there. Please pick up some of those items and help out the cause. Plus, you get to wear Justin's amazing artwork in those logos. I know Emily who is amazing. I'm actually going to be on the story behind the day this releases. As soon as you're done listening to this, if you haven't already go over and listen to Emily's show, the story behind, because I'm on the show doing the story behind the live stream for the cure. And all I did was I just talked about like kind of why we started the event last year and how we're continuing it this year and how we're going to make it even bigger and better. And then year after year after year, like three years from now, we're going to be doing live stream for the cure at halftime with the Super Bowl, probably. Right. Yeah, dude. I think that's our trajectory. That's a, that's an eager, easy goal. Probably. I'll probably be way too wasted though. I'll probably be too drunk with whoever the, you know, (laughs) halftime act is. Who, who will it be that year? It'll be us. A couple years. Epic film guys podcast. We'll we'll be the, we'll be the full halftime. We're doing halftime with the Super Bowl. I think we could do it as long as the hopester doesn't show up and ruin the fucking Super Bowl for everybody. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Dude, dude, he'll ruin the entire fucking game. Remember remember the controversy about Janet Jackson and the nipple clamp and everything? That was the whole thing. Well, imagine that'd be like the Hobster. That'd be child's play to the Hobster. He would offend everybody from every walk of life somehow. I he would, know. dude. Actually, he, w- he would live actually <laughs> suck the blood from the penis and the scrotum of a man. Then he'd put balls in his mouth <laughs> on live television, ladies and gentlemen. That's what he would do. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are super thrilled to have you here tonight because, of course, we are going to be talking about the Big Daddy. Ten years, Justin, ten years in the making and 18 films all leading up, we've been doing it all month long with our two mini sods, and then of course last week's show with the god of podcasting himself not here tonight because he's dead. Infinity War killed yeah. him. It's official. Dude, the movie Ooh, killed him. Boys. It totally did. Yeah. I feel for any theater employee, any theater manager over this past weekend, this is the first movie in a long time, Nick, where I actually waited in line. I already had tickets. I I, I bought them two months ago. Um, you know, but I actually had to wait in line to, to actually go into the theater. It was a huge line. It's like a huge event. This movie literally just broke box office records. It just beat The Force Awakens record, and it actually took in a bigger amount than Justice League did in its whole run in just one weekend. Huge. Gigantic. <laughs> I know, Shock, right? You're shocking. laughing over there. You're laughing. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Though. Like you just said, 10 years in the making, no other film series has done this. This no. is a monumental feat, whether you like all the films or not, whether you like Infinity War or not. We're going to get into that in our review of the film in a little bit. But um, you have to give them credit for being able to create this thing and actually build the world, get you in you know, it ingrained in these characters and uh, it's, it's, it's insane. It's awesome. No, absolutely. Before we get there, I do want to go ahead and just remind everybody out there once again, in just a couple of weeks, live stream for the cure 2.0, trying to raise money to, we're trying to raise money for the cancer research Institute. Justin, $5,000 is our goal to fight cancer Please, 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 if you're not going to be able to make the event and you want to support the show, I see that your own mother-in-law was even messaging us back and forth about how she can donate because you can't mail in payments to it. It's weird. It, I mean, it, yeah. they wouldn't go to us if you did anyway. Yeah, but. Some people are old school and they don't they don't want to use an online way of making payments. So she is sending a check in and we're going to have that donation made in her name 
manually, which is but be amazing. Um, yep. If that's something so, that you don't want to do, you don't want to do it online. There's other ways. Just get in contact with either Nick or I, and we can work it out. Yeah, we'll figure it out. But if you can't make the event, please make that early dono. And if you're going to make the event, and if you've got a favorite show, we're running a contest. I actually decided, Justin, we're just going to make the giveaway a fifty dollar gift card, like a Visa gift card, and then we'll probably add some EFG swag in there with it. But I don't feel like dealing with the whole nonsense of an EFG prize pack. So whatever, we'll just give them a fifty dollar gift card. And then they're going to spend it in our Redbubble store, right? Eh? Wink, wink, uh, wink. Oh, <laughs> I sure as hell hope so, David. I didn't spend all that time on those designs for nothing. Just no, wanted just to give it but... out there. But the, the <laughs> show that raises the most money in one half hour, so in a half an hour block. So if you're a show that's on for longer than a half an hour, no, you don't get to add them all together. It's one half an hour block. The show that wins will win a $50 gift card and more and other EFG swag. I mailed out 33 sets of stickers today to people who have either been playing the live stream for the Cure promo, which you're going to hear in just a moment, or that have been, uh, you know, signing up and that are going to be part of the event. It's going to be absolutely amazing. There's so much amazing podcasting talent involved and I'm super excited. I'm I'm super, super excited. So May 18th through the 20th, starting at 6 p.m. Eastern time is when the event goes live. I'll be live probably at like, I don't know, 5, 5.30 doing pre-checks and stuff like that. But why don't we go ahead, Justin? We've got a lot of stuff to talk about tonight. So why don't we go ahead and we'll run that promo for live stream for the cure. And then we'll get down into the nitty gritty of whatever we were doing this week. Sounds good to me. Let's roll it. Boom. I'm Nick. And I'm Justin. We are the Epic Film Guys, and we'd like just a moment of your time to talk about an extremely important event coming up this May. Last year, we hosted the live stream for The Cure, a 12-hour live stream fundraiser where we raised $2,500 for the Cancer Research Institute. 86 cents out of every dollar raised goes to research toward finding a cure. And this year, we're aiming to smash that goal, and we need your help to do it. Join us from May 18th through the 20th for 30 hours of amazing live stream content from us and a whole host of amazing podcasters who will be joining us to try to reach $5,000. For more information, please visit www.livestreamforthecure.com. Together, we can make a difference. And just here, before we roll on and continue with the show, I do want to send out our heartfelt our heartfelt thoughts to Heather of the Sunshine and Power Cuts podcast, who is going to be our guest for our final block on Friday, May the 18th. Uh, actually lost a family member to cancer just this past week. So that's the reason why we're doing this event, because it's fuck cancer, man. It, it's taken too many lives and whatever we can possibly do to help to raise money to fight against cancer. I want to do. And I, I really think we're going to have a much bigger and and more badass event this year than we did last year. This one's got far more moving parts, which has been a little crazy to rein in, <laughs> but it'll be worth it in the end to raise that money and to do some good in the world. It'll be really, really good, Justin. If there's anyone that can handle that kind of pressure on his shoulders, it's you, Nick. You you know how to handle the pressure, man. I'm going to so die I, at Deadpool I, I, on yeah. Sunday. Sunday after the live stream for The Cure, I'll be halfway through the movie and I'll, Dude, I'll you're going to see die. that movie after you finish the live stream? I can't even, I don't know. I think I'll have to see it a second time, man. Yeah. But I was telling you after on, the live on, stream, on the Hoster's so Dumpster, I was saying, you should just chug some whiskey after and you'll be good. Mm, Jesus. I don't even know how I'm going to do it. But speaking of chugging whiskey, Justin, why don't we go ahead and roll into something else that we do every single week on this show. I'm, of course, talking about what are you drinking? I'm back. Puke and rally. Yeah. Woo! Give me a beer. And let's pitch it over to you first. I want to hear from Ooh. you. I got to know. Ooh. What hast thou got funneling into thy face pie hole? Ooh. Ooh. Jesus. God. I just took a whiff of this for the first time. Man. And I, I just opened this can. I've never had this before. I actually went over to... Someone that listens to the show, Tony Dobish, Tony, Toby, who I called him Toby, Toby, your name is Toby. He he pointed out to me that I called him Toby on the show last week. I said, you know how much I drink on the show usually? It depends on the show, uh, but I felt super bad about that. But I actually went over to his place. Uh, we exchanged a beer and he gave me this beer because he's an awesome guy and uh, he's a podcaster himself. So yep. um we had some great talks about our co-hosts and the fun of podcasting, but again, we both love great beer. So what I'm, what I just opened, I haven't tasted it yet, is the Aslan Brewing Company's 
How Now Brown Cow. It's a milk stout with coffee oh, and maple. Coffee sold. and maple. And it's six point scent alcohol by volume. I don't know how this is going to go, but man, the smell on this thing. Oof. I'm already there. So. I'm already, I love the color of it. It looks like motor oil. It, it looks does, like dude. motor oil. It's just pure blackness. Love it. love it. I need it in my body. Give me it. Give me it. Okay. The maple's more on the finish, but that coffee is super strong up front on the aroma. Uh, on the, this, the coffee is super strong up front on the aroma. I actually really like this. It's very light. Oh, light God, and milk stout are not words you yeah. hear together often. In the sense that it's not too thick. You know, I've had some stouts from Aslan, like the one that I had that I gave you, the macaroon, oh, where yeah, it's that like, was just like syrup. Holy fuck. You know, it's just like you're drinking syrup. I still like them, but it's more like it's a dessert beer where I'll drink it and I'll fall asleep on the couch. Usually those beers are a lot higher in ABV. This is lower. And uh, so when I say light, I don't really mean light, but I mean light for one of their beers, I yeah, guess. But yeah. oh, man, the aroma on this thing is great. Man, that's amazing. Well, Justin. I'm not drinking anything too fancy tonight. I actually talked about this last week on the show. It was the only beer I bought in the Finger Lakes. I've had it before. It is Southern Tears Citra Hopped Live Pale Ale. And it's a very, very serviceable pale ale. Very, very clean drinking. Very, very smooth. And I'll be honest, I'm really only drinking it so I can have the bottles to bottle my milk stout. And <laughs> my... Uh, That's a good excuse, though. My IPA that I've got right now. I've actually got to bottle both of those this weekend so they will both be ready for the live stream for the cure again i'm only going to do about half of the milk stout though i'm only going to bottle probably about two gallons worth of it and i'm going to order some bourbon barrel chunks i actually looked them up they're super cheap super super cheap you can just get chunks like of an old bourbon barrel that they cut up and just throw it right in there and it'll just infuse with that nice bourbon flavor and you kind of bourbon barrel aging the stout so that's gonna be super exciting but yeah this is you've had it before i know you have it's super clean super easy drinking nothing too complicated a little bit lighter definitely way lighter than the beer you're drinking you want to talk about light <laughs> but still nice got a nice fresh kind of a uh, little burst of citrusy hops right up front but that's it it's 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 literally about as perfect as it gets for a pale ale and southern tier i mean they rarely steer you wrong it's been a long time since I've had one of their beers. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, I say it on the show week in and week out, and I'm actually sporting. Those of our listeners can't see it because I'm on the video, but this is an Aslan. This is an American flag shirt. I see. I see hops as the stars. That's amazing. Yeah, hops as the stars. But they're 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 going through all their inventory and just giving giving shit away. So I got this tank top for five bucks. But well, that's because they're I probably mean, are, are they getting ready to move to that new facility now? No, unfortunately, dude, that was supposed to open in the first quarter of 2018, and it's not even halfway done yet. Jesus. One thing they did do, which is pretty awesome, and they're making a lot of money at Nick, is they have the Aslan Beer Garden at the Washington Nationals Major League Baseball Stadium oh, in Washington, D.C. Nice. Tons of people are flocking to that shit. They're posting pictures every week that they're there, and dude, people are just showing up, not even going to the game, just to like drink Aslan beer outside the stadium and just have a great time. Dude, so that's hopefully amazing. raise enough money because I'm telling you, next time you come down here, that's the key. Take you there, make you maybe go down to Richmond to Vale and some other breweries, and hopefully it'll be done by the time you get here. Yeah, 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 maybe. Well, speaking of just next time I come down there, nice, wonderful segue there. Uh, I do want to say before we segue, um. Also, shout out to Perry and Lindsay. Uh, Perry's been having some health issues lately, especially from the way he talks on Hello Life and the pod stuff. They're two podcasts. Uh, a lot of kind of the same sort of issues that I have, especially with like acid reflux and stuff. Uh, but they're really, really cool. They're going to be our final guests on the live stream for The Cure, Justin, on Sunday night. Ooh. They're going to be hanging out with us through the end of the show. But Justin, I know you got to have a lot of fun this weekend. So why don't you tell me what kind of shenanigans you got up to? Oh well, I got I got shat on by a bunch of geese. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, they shit on me. Yes. They shit on me. They shit on me. It's, it's some true, fucking totally. shit, you fucking stupid bitch. <laughs> Man, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the wife said, you know, we don't, we don't. It's gonna be nice over the weekend. At least Saturday's gonna be nice. So let's go out and enjoy ourselves while the weather's nice. We drove into D.C., actually Georgetown to be exact, a couple blocks from where the Exorcist steps are, and we went kayaking in the river right outside D.C. And it was beautiful, great day for it. And we don't do that much outside stuff because my girls they don't like to camp, they don't like to hike because they don't like bugs and shit. So I'll take anything like outdoorsy that I can get. And it was oh, a yeah. blast. But like I told you pre-show. 
I saw this huge tree and all these geese and all these birds and like cranes and herrings and like they're all flocking and then perching in this big tree. And I'm like, hey, I'm going to go kayak and like go right underneath them so I can get a good look at all these birds. And as I do, they shat all over the kayak and I got shit all over my leg. So after we got done kayaking... We walked up into Georgetown to get some lunch at this really cool pizza place called Pizza Paradiso, and they actually have a fantastic, huge um, line of uh, craft beers that they sell there. It's actually one of the first places I went to when I first moved here because of their craft beer list, and I'm sitting there and I'm eating this. I, the pizza, I should show you a picture of it, Nick. I know you're, you being the huge foodie that you are, it had mussels on it, oysters, and it had shrimp on it. It was like a seafood pizza. It was fantastic. But I'm sitting there eating this fancy pizza with bird shit all over my leg. So, yeah, that, that, that's what I did Saturday, man. That's literally what I did Saturday. What did you do? Did you do anything? Uh. Well, Other than I plan had the for chance. Live stream for I, the know you, I know you already know what I did, so it's kind of uh, pointless <laughs> to try to tease it or anything. But I did get a chance to watch two movies I did not get the chance to catch last year. I uh, watched Molly's Game, and I got to watch Alexander Payne's film Downsizing. Uh, why, Alexander Payne? Why? Just, I love Alexander Payne. He directed my favorite movie of all time, which is about Schmidt. And he directed a movie that's probably in my top 10 of all time, which is Sideways. He's one of those directors that whenever he releases something, I have to see it until he made Downsizing. The reviews were so bad and everybody was just shitting all over it. And I just kind of was like, I, I don't really know if it really came out around here anyway. Um, if it did, it got probably like a one or two week release really quick, quiet, one screen, maybe two showings a day or something. So I just was like, all right, fine. I'm just going to miss this one. I'll catch it on Redbox. What a disaster. It's just not good. It 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 like constantly shifts tone all the time. And like it, the, the central conceit of the movie for me, like the whole time I'm like, I'm watching it. The whole central conceit of it is you get shrunken down to where you're five inches tall. And right. when you get shrunken down, apparently your wealth, like say you take all of your assets, Justin, you liquidate all of your assets and you take all that money and it becomes worth like an exponentially larger amount because you're small. And for me, I'm like, but that doesn't make any sense because who builds all this small shit? Is it big people? Like who built like the original small town? Like, did they build it and then shrink it? Like, wouldn't they require a normal size paycheck when they're making it and then it gets shrunk down? Like, where do they get all the fucking materials for it? Like, and, I mean, they're talking like intricate houses. Like, you're looking at all these really lavish, nice, amazing houses. Like, who builds, who builds these things? Legitimately, who builds them? Like, the, the economics of the film don't work for me. And then, it, like I said, it's just constantly changing tone. Like, it... It, it is. It, I don't, it, dude. Fuck you're, this you're movie. saying the exact same thing. You're saying the exact same thing that Loy saw said to me yeah. as soon as he got back from seeing it earlier. Early, he saw it wicked early last year, sometime yeah. some Alamo event or something, and he's like, "It sucked. I hated it. And it was it's, frustrating it's for him." And it's the same thing good. that you just said. It's not good. It's it, it, and Alexander Payne and Jim Taylor. It's a screenwriting partner. They, I mean, literally about Schmidt. Sideways, as I said, even the Descendants with Clooney, which I also really, really liked. Like they've done some great, great movies together, but this one it was just a. Strong great miss just i think you was not there man it looked interesting i think it's an interesting concept at, at best think for for real that's but. its problem i think that's its problem because the only hook it has is its concept once you actually shrink them down where else does the film have to go it has literally nothing else to do so then it starts doing all this other weird random shit like it just it was just pointless it was I, just i'd rather pointless. just fucking watch honey i shrunk the kids man i'd actually rather watch <laughs> honey i blew up the kid i'm gonna watch that shit instead <laughs> You actually saw you saw another movie though that I saw last I, December. I did. In I theaters. saw. I saw Molly's Game, which is uh, written and Aaron Sorkin stepping behind the chair for the first time, stepping first behind time, the yeah, camera. Man. And you know what? I I won't say it was a terrible movie. Um, I enjoyed it sort of, but I liked it a lot. A lot of the problem I really had with the film is like half of the film really feels like it's her reading her autobiography to you, and. I don't go to movies to get fucking read to. And a lot of the stuff, like, I get it. It makes sense contextually because her character is very self-important. Like, she constantly is inflating her own importance the entire runtime of that film. And especially elevating, like, the power that she perceives that she has over people. 
so it's really, really nice to kind of like, she's constantly talking about all these movie stars and athletes and billionaires and everybody else that she has them all at her tables. Do, do, her do you know who the, stuff. do you know who the Michael Sarah character is? It's supposed like to be Tony McGuire, isn't it? That's right. I'm just making yeah. sure you knew. Yeah. Yeah. I remember reading about that when the film came out, but, uh, but yeah, like it, I just, that part of it rubbed me a little bit wrong. So I would probably only maybe give that movie, well, Downsizing had give like a fucking four or a three. It just wasn't good. Molly's game, I'd probably give a seven still. Um, Jessica yeah. Chastain is a fucking dude. Knockout, isn't she great? Dude. She is isn't just... she amazing in that movie. You can't oh. take your fucking eyes off her. Even, even in the slow scenes where it's just like the, the camera's focusing on her, you're like, the, the, is... the wardrobe they put on her. I mean, oh. She is number one. She is an acting powerhouse. She is so she is. good at what she does and she invests herself so fully in these characters and just like dude the look of that character like the seductive sexy as hell outfits that they put her in and she's got the figure to pull it off oh my god and then you've got Idris Elba in this also fantastic and Kevin Costner who I didn't even know was in it I didn't even remember yeah. that also fantastic in the film great chemistry great chemistry dude, with all even three Sarah, of those even yeah. Michael Sarah was great yeah, he, he was, was legit yeah. good in the movie, so that was really, really nice. So it had a lot of good elements going for it, especially from Sorkin, who especially recently made The Social Network, which I still consider probably one of the best films of this decade. For me, it was just like, dude, just have her stop reading so much. I, I take it you haven't watched Casino in a long time, because I just showed it to my daughter like a month ago, and I'm like, I forgot that like the first quarter of this fucking movie is all just narration. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. That's why when you were, you post about it on Facebook, I'm like, I'll, I'll give them until the end of the movie, because I know you'll see a lot of great things out of that it's, movie. It, starts to, it, it really gets better as the film goes on, and the narration becomes less of an issue as the film goes on. And Jared had actually asked me over in the, over in the hopes or dumpster. He said, was it as bad as live by night narration? No, it's not because at least in, in, um, in Molly's game, all she's really doing is giving exposition about her character. Like she's not really, she's not telling the story to you. And that's why live by night. That's why I hate it so much is because it's literally half like telling you the story of the movie instead of showing it to you, <laughs> Which, again, is an egregious fucking sin when it's a visual medium. So, no, I still hate Live By Night with a fiery passion. But Molly's Game, like I said, there's a lot of good redeeming qualities to it. And Chastain is just, I mean, I'll hit the button again, man. She's just, oh, fucking knockout, well, dude, man. I didn't have any other Utterly movies I watched gorgeous. over the weekend. The, she is, the, like, one of the classiest, most elegant, beautiful women in Hollywood. Just straight up and I love her. I'm hoping she gets that role actress. in the new it movie man I'm hoping she gets that role she in the did. new it the, I thought she already second. did well it's it's that she's in talks that's the way they get headlines now is that Jessica Chastain is now officially in talks it wasn't she's officially cast so. yeah. I thought um, that she was the one that was already confirmed or whatever but I think they're just going to keep throwing more yeah. money at her until she agrees to do it but yeah I we'll definitely see. would love to see her do it um but I you know wrapping this part of the show up here I did not get a chance to watch any other movie wow. um other than infinity war over the weekend but i did get a chance to watch something that i highly anticipated for a long time it's a documentary called 7852 hitchcock's shower scene and i totally forgot about this nick i posted the trailer back in like september of last year and i really wanted to watch it and it hit like select theaters and didn't even hit here and i was looking around i was about to rent it on amazon when i realized hey i have hulu too and it was on there for free so those of you that have hulu right now and you hear this episode Go on there right now and watch this documentary. It is about the cultural impact and the impact on cinema that the shower scene in Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho had. It has a wide array of actors, filmmakers, editors, uh, you name it. Eli Roth is in this thing. Guillermo del Toro. They get the best of the best in there. Um it's fantastic. It, it's about an hour and a half, hour, 45 minutes. And it really goes in depth and, and just literally takes that scene and literally just you, you figure every single bit of it out and you, you, you see how film changed and how the horror genre changed and how the suspense genre changed and, and how he created that one scene and how it's so beautiful and it's so brutal all at the same time. And it's, it's a great watch for any cinephile, any film lover and any fan of Hitchcock or horror, anything like if you like movies, this is a documentary for you. Cause you learn so much about how a great scene is shot. And I loved it. Fantastic. It's kind of actually, it's kind of funny that you even bring that up because when they released psycho, 
Hitchcock went to such lengths to keep people from spoiling the film that he even had, you know, like signs and stuff hung up at theaters. Signs. They wouldn't let signs, people in yeah. after the film started. That's and right. And li like literally there were posters and, and, and signs hanging up all over the theater to not talk about the movie after you had That's seen right. it to give everybody else a chance to see it. And that leads perfectly into the next segment to talk about Infinity War, Justin, because this is a film that... I literally, I, I literally consider it impossible to talk about without spoiling the ever loving shit out of it. I 100% agree. I with you. don't know what you could possibly talk about in a spoiler free section other than to say, yeah, this performance was good. This performance Captain was America good. Captain America hit something. He you, you hit know, something. Like you can't, I, I feel like you can't be like anything but the, the most broad and most generic. So we're going to spoil the movie when we get into that discussion of it. We've got some Facebook feedback from some of our fans out there. And I put a contest out there, Justin, for some fans to guess mm -hmm. our ratings. Ooh. And we're going to see how correct they are and see if anybody is going to win a prize. I said it was stickers, but it'll be some prize, whatever I feel like sending them, quite frankly. Loy sauce. We're going to send you Loy sauce. I'll get them so hammered. On whiskey, I'll knock him out. He'll be on that rye whiskey, baby. With a gag check, and, check. Yeah, I got some rye whiskey check. I bought up in the Finger Lakes from Meyer Farm. I'll give him some of that. That shit is good. Yeah, we'll see how he handles that, man. I mean, go to Ned Devine's last week, and hey, he's getting where he can out drink this old man over here. I don't know. Man, what have he's I done? Got that, he's got that young body with that uh, quick metabolism. He can still yeah. work it through him really, really quick. That's what it is. I don't know. But, Justin, we are going to take... A quick little break here. We're going to roll into some EFG history, which was sadly missing from the show last week because I had no time to actually pull EFG history clips. I've got a bunch for this week, including some from our Megasode that we did back in episode 95, where we had something like 10 people on the mic. It was literal audio insanity. I don't even know how the hell we did it. And I don't know, some other fun stuff. We'll throw it in here. EFG history. And we'll be right back to talk Infinity War. We'll be right back. This week in epic film history. We will jump over to our good friends from Netflix and Swill and start with Caleb. What do you got guzzling down your gullet? I'm smoking meth, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing where you live, that is not a shock. <laughs> oh my lord. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Have you ever decided to do another run like you? You know how you used to do your runs? You used to go on like those races and shit. It'd be funny if you did a whole race and like just put Patrick Swayze in like the back of your shirt or something so he was facing everyone behind you. If there was anyone behind I think, you. Well, no, there wouldn't be. <laughs> I'd, be I'd be bringing up the ass end. But if, you know, it, it would get the women, if there were any women that were trailing behind me, to run a lot faster when they stare into those gorgeous, gorgeous black and white eyes that he has. He's That's dreamy. Good. It's goddamn right. They're thinking uh, back. They're, they're thinking back to their teenage years or their high school uh, years. In the eighties. So the only reason anybody fucking likes Dirty Dancing is because they all want to be baby, and they all want to be swept off their feet by some fucking hunky, muscular fucking dance instructor out in the middle of the goddamn woods in the summer. That's why I, I, I want to kind uh, of make a free for all. Give people as much shit or as little shit as you want to for their picks, and I'll fucking care. Uh, but John, what are uh, let's do all three of your picks. All three of your films, what you'd take to a desert island and why. All right. Well, uh, what I would actually go with would be like... Um, no, John, start saddles. over and start over with words. Oh, <laughs> words and sentences. Words <laughs> and sentences there. All I, right, all I heard was... So the movies I would actually pick to go with me on a desert island would actually be like uh, Blazing Saddles, mm -hmm. uh, Rush Hour, and the 1990s <laughs> TMNT. <laughs> no! Rush Hour was just the TMNT! Oh my god, damn life, are you kidding me? I want to well, cry. Like, so out <laughs> like the other. <laughs> no! <laughs> Holy shit, dude. Oh my god. This is an absurd list. <laughs> what do we wait? We didn't talk about rush hour. What the Did fuck? Did you make man? this Come list on. after you got drunk? <laughs> Don't you understand? No, the words that are coming really out of my like mouth. Rush hour. 
Holy yeah, I like Rush Hour too, but I would never take that on a fucking desert island of me. Are you kidding me? Are you insane? I've watched it a lot of times. <laughs> That's the movie you binge watch right before you build up the courage to kill yourself when you're stranded. Let's be clear. This is not movies that you would leave on a desert island. This is something you have to take with you. So. <laughs> I want, I want to dissect. I want to dissect these picks. Okay, so John, did you make that list before or after explain. you started drinking? I think everybody's pretty much fine with the turtles. Yes, yeah, yes. No, I respect. I think everyone's perfectly saddles, fine yeah. with blazing saddles. It. But are you telling me well, you? Are you trying to put yourself in some kind of fucking purgatory where you have to listen to Chris Tucker for eternity? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. My, my backup choice originally was I was I thought maybe that would be way too like fucking old for to say like I was just going to continue to use like the Secret Life of Walter Mitty from 1947, <laughs> and I, I figured everybody would just give me just as much shit. So I was like, ah, I don't give a damn. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and it's time, Justin. It's, it's time. time to talk about literally the movie that every single other movie podcast is going to be releasing a review of. In the every next single other days. person. Yeah. Every single other person even in some the non world movie, right now. Even some non-movie podcasts, I'm sure, will be dropping it. Yeah. Movie review shows. So thank you. If you if you decided to listen to the Epic Film Guys review of Infinity War, thank you. Uh, Justin and I will... Uh, eh, We'll, we'll tell you when we're going to start spoiling the film, which will be early into our review, because, I, again, as we mentioned in the previous segment, I don't feel that you can really, really fairly discuss this film without discussing the plethora of spoilers that are sure to come out uh, when we talk about it. So uh, keep that in mind if you have not seen the film. I really do think if you haven't seen the film, Justin, I would say hold off on the review, see the film, and then come back. Yeah, don't definitely. listen to the review first because... There's so much to see in this film. There's so much to digest, and it really is probably better enjoyed uh, just just by itself. Just just by itself. I really, really think that it is. So uh, before, however, we get into our review proper, Justin, I put it out on Facebook earlier when I mentioned that we were not going to be doing a live stream tonight. I put it out, and I wanted people to tell us their thoughts on Infinity War, and I wanted them to guess our ratings, and we'll announce that a little bit later once Justin and I know each other's ratings because we haven't talked about this film at all. Nope. Literally, what's we don't we don't we don't do that anymore. We, we really don't. The like, only thing I posted than... <laughs> was a, an extremely snarky. I saw. Well, I it was saw. better than Justice League, but if you know me, you know how much I hated Justice League. That could literally mean anything. Well, that's how I took it. Whenever you post shit now, I, I know not to take you seriously. Whereas I used to start getting angry and being like, God damn him. But, you know, I'll wait a minute. I'll wait till the show. I can't unfollow you. I have to still see what you're posting. But like sometimes I'm like, no, I don't want to see anything he's posting. I don't want to know anything because sometimes someone will comment on your post and say something about what you thought. And then you'll make a remark about it. And I'm like, no, I don't want to know anything because then it would make the show boring. I want to be surprised. But it's true. I don't know what you think at all. I have no clue. So we did not talk about it. But we, again, we put it out over on Facebook. And I just want to run through some of your comments over from the Hobster's Dumpster earlier tonight. Uh, from Brantley Oliver, once again, Marvel has demonstrated that they can balance a large ensemble of characters and keep focus on what is important. Justin Winter said garbage 7 out of 10, which is a Podfix Network in-joke. Because <laughs> that's... Uh, that's something I can't remember what movie that was about. I think that comes from our Nolan Megasode last year, that Christopher Nolan Megasode that we did, where something with Dan, I can't remember, something with Dan. Uh, Shampoo said sight unseen, I gave it a perfect five out of seven. Why can't we get serious answers out of Podfix members? <laughs> from Jared Taylor, I give it an eight, eight out of ten. I really enjoyed it. Thanos was an amazing villain, and I give major credit to the Russo brothers for balancing all the stories going on. Having said that, I take off points because it's not a cohesive movie, more like a series of vignettes. Also, the ending was a half-ass attempt for stakes. Almost spoilerish there. I thought about maybe, maybe should I read that? And I was like, yeah, yeah, it doesn't give him anything away. Greg yeah. Ship said, inconsistent pacing broke my immersion, yet the most fleshed out and interesting villain drew me back in. Seven out of ten for him. And from Paul from The Countdown, our very good friend and brother down in Perth, Marvel effectively redresses two of the biggest criticisms of the entire series, poor villains, and no stakes. So, and we can't forget our, our good old friend Loy Sauce, who saw the film, <gasps> the our sauce? own epic film, Loy Choss, right. Steak Sauce. Like, like a day yeah, after saw, we recorded last week, 
he saw it Tuesday and he actually did a little critic blurb for us on our page, which we thank him very much for. He said, even when it threatens to become too much of everything with an excess of characters, subplots, and for better or worse, that trademark humor, the Avengers Infinity War proves that Marvel can still surprise us, move us, and even further invest us in these characters and the universe they inhabit. So... That was the first word the Epic Film Guys got out about this movie. And thanks, everyone, for all of your responses in regards to the film. I'm surprised we didn't get more, honestly, because everyone, literally every single person on social media is talking about this I think this was probably my fault because I didn't post it until I got home from work tonight. So it only literally went up a few hours before we recorded. (laughs) Uh, but thank you, yes, everybody that got back to us over there in the Hoster's Dumpster and let us know your thoughts. But, Justin, I guess it is time... I guess we've got to kind of open the salvos here and let's keep it, let's keep it spoiler free for now. And let's just open things up with just initial thoughts, just the broadest stroke you can paint it in on Avengers Infinity War. Okay. So there's no introduction necessary for this movie. I feel like every single person in the United States right now knows what this movie is about. It's been 10 years in the making. Like we said earlier in the show, this is a monumental feat for filmmaking above all, because no other film series, no other studio, no other anything has ever taken this much time and built a world of characters, individual films focused on these popular comic book characters and led it up to one singular film that was supposed to be the end all be all. I mean, this isn't the end, so to speak, but it is the one big yeah, as Nick said, it's this is the big one. This is the big kahuna. And um I, I I can't tell you enough. I was not we did we did our retrospectives on phase one and phase two, but I was not going into this with the anticipation level of some people. I know a lot of people were so over the top excited about this. And I, I was excited. I, I had excitement uh, in my bones. I was sitting there, I was shaking when the credits rolled and everything. But the Again, if you've listened to the show before, you know that Nick and I have gone through what we've called a Marvel fatigue at times. And even last week, as you heard, Nick actually loved a Marvel movie. So Nick has kind of changed a little bit um, the last year or so on Marvel films. But either way, I think everyone has been at least somewhat interested in seeing this movie. My initial thoughts were, Nick, that it's in the top five Marvel films, most likely for me, and I won't put any any ranking or anything, but as far as entertainment, as far as being able to balance characters, action sequences, and being able to give us a cohesive story, that and that word that we like to talk about all the time on the Epic Film Guys podcast, villain, the villain, your heroes are only as good as their villain is. And in this case, I really enjoy Josh Brolin's Thanos a lot. Yeah. And and there's a lot to enjoy with that. And of course we're going to get into a lot of that stuff when we get into spoilers. And I mean, I went into this with very measured expectations. I have had my rose with Marvel. I still, you know, think that, you know, there are certain movies in the Marvel cinematic universe that are just not very good. And those include movies that some people really, really love, but phase three did at least bring me somewhat back uh, in, into the fold. There were a lot better films in phase three, and it showed me that they were at least maybe learning some of the lessons and at least trying to make better films that like phase two, it really felt like almost a little bit of phoning it in and phase three. I really, really felt like they got some good filmmakers and they've really tried to go out of their way to make some really good pictures. That said, I would say, I don't know where this falls in the ranking of Marvel films for me, um, it's it's definitely not the worst. It is definitely not even close to the worst. Is it like the tippy top of that list, the absolute, you know, best of the bet? No, no, it, it's not the best. It does have some issues, which I definitely want to get into. But I think overall, I I think it's it's good. I I think it's 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 overall good. But I, like I said, I I definitely had a few issues with it that that really restrained me. But but there were some really, really interesting narrative decisions that they made in this film, Justin, that I felt really did it some favors. And I, I don't think it's spoiling anything to say it's the way that they break up the subplots in the film that makes it work the best because there's so many characters here. There are dozens and there's dozens too many. of heroes. Yeah, so there's many, too many characters. So what they did is they kind of 
take pockets of characters and send them off on their own subplot as part of the larger plot of this film, which of course is Thanos is coming. Thanos is trying to collect all the infinity stones, etc. So they have et each <laughs> like group of little characters doing their own kind of things. And I think like overall, I think the, the, the narrative approach from that direction, I think that that worked for the film's benefit. If they would have just I, tried I to too. throw this in here as this big clusterfuck of all these characters all over the place all the time, it would never have worked. Never. So I think what they did, they did, they did a smart thing. They broke it down into smaller clusters of characters and let the different cl clusters of characters interact with Thanos and with Thanos's children and have some amazing action sequences. There's some baller action in this film that we got to talk about over in the spoiler section. Oh, we but, will. We will. Like I said, overall, I think, I think it's good, but is it a great film? I don't think so. I, I don't think it is. Okay. Okay, that's where I think we'll disagree. And I think, honestly, I had an expectation that you were probably going to go there. Um, there are some things that lower my rating that I'll get to when we get to spoilers, where this film could have been a, a, an excellent. Okay, so where I'm leading off is Nick saying it's good. I'm saying it's very good, but it's not that much probably above what Nick is in the end going to say. I don't know for sure. I'll, but, I'll be willing um, to bet right now. I'll be willing to bet right now before we get into the thick of it. Our rating is probably one point off. Yeah, probably. I'm almost guaranteed. I'm almost guaranteed. Probably that one it is. point off. So, yeah. without further ado, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I will do. I don't normally do this, um, but I will timestamp in the show notes. Spoilers from here forward. We are going to spoilers spoil the ever loving shit out of this film. So if you don't want to be spoiled, stop now. Skip to whatever the timestamp is in the show notes. Continue. Okay. And Justin, let's lead it in. In three, two, spoil the shit out of it. <laughs> okay. So we open this movie and we witness Thanos. Okay. And this is after the events of Ragnarok, I'm pretty sure, which, yep. I, or yes. And okay. So we, we see him there and he had previously acquired the power stone from Xandar. Um, he and his henchmen, they intercept the ship and it's got the survivors of Asgard's destruction. So Thor and Loki are on the ship and Hulk. Um, and of course, you know, we see Thanos jump in and show his power. We see a little mini battle. And then, Nick, we see probably what I would feel like is one of the most emotional scenes that I've ever experienced in a theater full of people ever. Um, this is where the spoilers are coming into play. We see one of the most favorite Marvel cinematic characters of all time get killed. That's right. Why don't you tell our listeners who we're yeah, talking about? Yeah, easily. Loki gets fucking dispatched with ease. And this, the cold open to this film, I will say this from the outset, the cold open of this film is probably my favorite part of it. Because this, when you want to establish a villain in a film, this is how you do it. From the cold open, you have him come in. Look, number one, he beats the ever living fuck out of Hulk in like a second yeah. flat. Yep. Just immediately exactly. beats the shit out of Hulk and then just fucking breaks Loki pretty much in half. Just utterly destroys him. And this is how you establish a villain. Quite frankly, this is how you do it. Period. Because from the onset, you immediately know Thanos is here to fucking, he means business. He's not fucking around. And that, you know, this is Marvel basically sort of, and we're going to get there later, but this is Marvel basically sort of saying, okay, we get it. We're actually going to up the stakes a little bit and we're actually going to give you a villain that's really going to fuck shit up. And right. like I said, the cold open of this film, probably my favorite part of it. Yeah. Without I'm question. I'm telling you right now, man, I heard, I heard little literal gasps. Now I'm going to go out on a limb here and and say this up front in the review. This is the most interactive crowd that I've seen in a theater, Nick, um, in, a, in a regular theater ever. There was so many times where there were applause. There were gasps. I heard people crying. And I, I, I knew this was coming. I'm, I'm going to say this straight up. I knew that Loki was going to be the ones to go. Now, we're not going to get to the other possibilities and whoever else may have gone out uh, not just on yet. their end just yet. But uh, he was one that I knew. 
I, I just assumed, I mean, I heard Hiddleston's contract was up and we knew he's a fan favorite. Um, and so I, I knew that getting that out of the way, it's going to leave modern, regular general moviegoers like, oh my God, they aren't fucking around here. And like you said, I totally agree. We see Hulk get his ass handed to him. We've never seen that that quickly in a movie before. It just showed that power. So it raised the stakes maybe almost as high as they're going to go in this movie. Um but we we've we've had this mythic Thanos character teased to us for this whole time and we finally get him and I think it was the great way to open the movie and I think it was the b- fantastic way to where you're like okay he's fucking shit up he's awesome he looks great I'm down I'm in for the ride yeah and I and I think the film I I think the film paces itself really well for the most part I think it probably does lag a little bit here and there but I think for the most part, the film paces itself really well, because right after the cold open, we immediately get back to Earth. You meet back up with a couple of different characters here and there. And then, bam, Thanos' children immediately attack. So you're immediately drawn into another action sequence. What this tells Thanos isn't fucking around. His children are coming. They're coming for these Infinity Stones. And this shit is going to happen super fast. It's going to happen right away, right now. And you've got to be prepared. You've got to be ready. And like Thanos' children even make pretty short fucking work of Iron Man, Spider-Man, and Doctor Strange. Like, they kind of very handily hand them their asses in that battle. And I really, really love that about it. And then, bam, you automatically have Strange, who has the Time Stone, gone. You know? And immediately, like, the film the film immediately sets you up. Like, not only do you get that amazing cold open, but then you immediately get put into peril, like, these are these are his children. These are this is even Thanos himself. These are his children coming in and just straight and, fucking and they're shit that up. powerful. Yeah, yeah. And and we've seen and the thing is that's great about this and the way that the buildup is so perfect. We've had all these other films. We've seen these heroes battle other foes, so we know what they're capable of. We've seen them handle things, so we're like, okay, we've got Spider Man and Doctor Strange and Iron Man all together. Like this is going to be a cinch. And this was one of my favorite action sequences, Nick, because of the fact that we've seen them fighting in New York. We've seen them fighting in big cities, big deal. But the tone of the scene was very cold, very dark, very yep. sinister and serious where you're like, wow, shit can really happen here. And I loved it. We got to see, we've seen Iron Man and Spider-Man on screen before, but, but mixing in Dr. Strange into that as well. I loved the action in this sequence. I thought it was fantastic. I thought the energy was there, but it had that physical threat. I loved it. I I thought it was a great way to go from that cold open. There are a number of different ways in the film that they do this, that they play these different characters' abilities off of each other, and one of my favorite sequences in the film, action-wise, was in this battle sequence when they were using the portals. They were using the portals and Spider-Man kept swinging in and out of the portals and kicking the dude's ass. Like That was really, really cool, and there were a lot of really, really great touches like that throughout the film where it was one character using the other's powers to their benefit and 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 really moving on and then you move forward in the film and then the film kind of keeps doing this where it has another group of heroes it slowly kind of starts bringing other people into the picture so next it brings in vision who of course has the mind stone embedded in his forehead and you know i i really really think and this is like I said about the narrative structure of this film, and I don't want to really mention it from there. We'll move on, but it's really smart the way that they do everything because they bring in vision and Scarlet witch. Okay. And then because they bring in vision and Scarlet witch, it gives them a reason to bring in cap and Falcon and uh, black widow. And then from there, it gives you a reason to bring in Wakanda and black Panther, because then they have to go, you know, take, what, uh, take vision to Wakanda to try to have the mind stone extracted from him. Right. You know, exactly. I really, really think that the way that they kind of used this part to lead to this part, to lead to this part, to lead to this part. It, it was, was very all, expertly done. Man. Yeah. It was, it was very it calculated. Was really, out. It, they very, very, they wove it together very, very well. I'll say. And, and you know, I, I don't want to take that away from them because I, again, I'm going to have some problems with this film when we get a little bit later in it, but I really think, like I said, I, I I was on board with this movie, especially from, say, probably the opening 45 minutes to an hour was where this movie really had me. And I was like, I love this. Like, I legit 100% love this. And it's once the film kind of starts getting into, like, now that you've gone back to visit the groups of characters again and the, the plot's kind of continuing along, 
that's where it kind of falls off the rails just a little bit for me is probably in that middle act just a little bit. And it just, you know, it has a lot of character introductions and it has a lot of moments. And I don't know how you feel about this, Justin, but this is actually something that Tom Co, our good friend from Jake and Tom Conquer the world actually mentioned to me, but he felt, and I actually felt this the same way about uh, Thor Ragnarok as well. Like at times, there's too much humor in here, especially oh, with the don't tone even of get the me scene. Started. Don't even get me started. With the tone oh my god! Of the okay, scenes, you're hitting the nail on the head, man. Some of these tones, some of the tones Oof. in these scenes is so is so dramatic, and like Marvel had a chance here. Marvel had a real shot here at really leveling some great dramatic scenes, and then they would sneak in a quip. Some character would have Dude, a quip yeah. all the time. And it was really, it pulled me out of some scenes. It was like, come on, like there's like really tense dramatic scenes and you have to make a fucking joke right now. Dude, you're like, hitting legit. the, the- Really, we're going to yeah. address this elephant in the room right now because what it's... you're talking about is my number one fucking problem with this movie. You had this opportunity. You have the Russos. Your previous movies, yeah, you had quips in them. You had little jokes here and there. You had whatever, spouting out one-liners, but it fit the scene. It was fine for it. This is the one where I wanted the stakes raised as high as they'll ever go. Okay, I don't see anything ever being as high as this movie. And the movie. cold open, that's the funny thing, is the cold open <sighs> immediately sets those stakes. It shows Thanos is here, he's not fucking around, his children aren't fucking around, this is a dangerous situation, and these heroes have got to get their shit together. And then legit joke after joke after joke after joke after joke after joke, and some of them were funny. I'm not saying that I didn't like all of them, but it just became I'd too say about saturated. 60% of them there were too I'd many. say about 60% it was just too maybe. much. All Dial the time, it the dude. fuck Literally. down a bit. What you're talking about is the reason why this movie's not going to have the rating that I wanted to give it, and why it did take me out. Like I said, no, I did laugh a lot, and I in like I said earlier, the crowd that I was in, the most interactive. I mean, when there were people laughing, they were laughing fucking hard. They were like falling over in their seats. They were clapping at a lot of this stuff. But dude, this is the opportunity. Like you said, I really wanted this to have that serious emotional heft that was necessary because this movie's called infinity war and i wanted that war to feel like fucking war i mean do you joke when you're in a situation where everyone can die do do you really i mean if someone's about to die in front of you and you can see them in peril are you really going to make a joke about something and some of the jokes are lame as fuck i'm not gonna i'm I'm not hating but kind of i am and i'm gonna i'm gonna really attribute this to the fact that, Nick, this movie had six rewrites, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that they wanted to consult James Gunn because of the fact that Guardians of the Galaxy are in this movie. We know that everyone that likes the Guardians films, which isn't you, Nick, they <laughs> expect a certain <laughs> level of humor and a certain amount of humor. And, you know, while I felt like the Guardian scenes were fine, they were by far the weakest scenes for me, and I, I everything else I cared a lot more about, which goes to show... What what I felt I'll was more important in the story. Up until a certain point, with the weakness of yeah. their scenes, I will agree with you up to a certain but, point. But but for me, I felt like that was the necessary thing for them. They 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 felt they had to go in. Okay, well, we have to have that Guardians esque humor in here, or having them in the movie won't work. Like honestly, the truth is, can you imagine seeing the Guardians in a movie that's like super uber serious? No, I don't want the movie that serious. But I mean, I felt like the Crips, like you said, they come at really awkward moments where like this should nothing should be said here. Like you're in a situation where there's five of you and you're probably going to get killed and your possibility of of winning is zero to none. And you're still making jokes. I think the problem for me (laughs) is it just (sighs) when you have that amazing cold open that immediately sets this grave, uber threatening tone. When you constantly quip like that, it constantly lightens the mood and it kind of lessens the dramatic impact of everything that comes after it. Every time you do it, it just takes a little chink every single time out of that armor that you're just trying to you're trying to make this really dramatic piece. You're trying to have things have great emotional heft and they just lose a little bit of impact when you just have nothing but jokes again and again and again and again. It just doesn't work. And Speaking of things that didn't work for me, I want to get into this a little bit because this was mentioned before the film came out and this was mentioned in press, especially by the Russo's and by a lot of people coming up is that this was really a Thanos character piece. And I've got some qualms with that description of the film because while I will agree to some extent, because he is basically the character that drives forward the plot. I do agree to some extent, but there are certain scenes in the film and we can talk about the scene, Justin, when he goes to get the soul stone 
He has to make a sacrifice and he has to sacrifice Gamora to get the soul stone. I didn't buy the emotionality of that scene. I didn't buy the emotionality that they were trying to sell in the scene. And, and there's scenes like that in the film where like, they don't invest you enough in Thanos as a character, whether brother as a villain or whatever you want to do with him, they don't invest you enough in that character to make it be like, okay, he really cares enough about her to not do this or whatever. Like yeah, there's no real there wasn't tension enough time there. given to it. There was yeah, no real tension there about whether or not he was ever going to do it. And I think that lessens the dramatic impact of it. I want to throw this in here before I pitch it back over to you though. How fucking great was it to see the red skull there? That was fucking baller. Dude, dude. I was so shocked. Oh my God. That was great. That, dude. That, that was weaving one at least most, voicing him. Yep. Yep, right, definitely. Was, I know because one of the most genuine for years. surprises. One of the most genuine surprises in that film, dude. When he showed up, when like when he was like the floating ghoul thing or whatever, I was like, wait a minute, and I kept listening because I again, I'm gonna boast. I don't give a shit. I saw this in a Dolby Cinema with Atmos, and it was super loud and amazing and crystal clear. And I heard that voice, and I was like, dude, is that who I think it is? Like after a few lines, I started to connect the dots, and then when he revealed his face. I literally shat myself. I had goosebumps. I'm like, yeah. God damn it. Thank that you so much for bringing great, him back. Cause great reveal. Yeah. Great. But that, but Seriously. that was the problem of that scene for me because they do scenes when he's, when Gamora is younger, when he, and dude, number one, that scene where she's a little kid and he saves her and whatever. It's a chilling scene, but it doesn't give me the emotional connection to them as a pair that it needs to pay off later for that soul stone scene. But that scene itself, super fucking chilling when he oh, like, I love protects that her scene. and yeah. they, they, they split the people up on even on even sides. And he just like hides her face and shit as they legit mow half of the fucking population of the planet. That was an amazing fucking scene. But the, the problem is the problem is I don't buy the, the, the emotional connection between those two characters, neither of the Guardians movies ever sold it to me, and this movie doesn't sell it to me. So when it comes time for him to sacrifice her, I just don't buy well, it, and I just don't really feel the weight of the moment like they wanted me to. I feel like I feel like the first Guardians sold it the best out of anything that we've seen with her relationship with Thanos, because that's what the character is. You get it right off the bat that, that yeah. she hates him. She doesn't want to be a part of his legacy. And, and But I get what you're saying. I may not be to the extent that you're at where I felt like the scene itself, which, again, spoiler alert, that's another major character that we lose is Gamora uh, because he sacrifices her. That scene was done pretty well but i know what you mean like i didn't feel any emotion from it i felt a little bit upset when i saw loki go because i'm like god damn it i love hiddleston like i love this character but this scene like and you know what sells the loki death you know what sells it hemsworth it's hemsworth's reaction as thor it's 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 hemsworth acting he he pulls off a great performance in that scene because he sells it 100 percent. well he does to be fair though not to go off on a tangent or thing but he does mention when he's being questioned about it with the guardians he's like he's been dead before and he says that and i'm like oh that leads me to believe they could bring him back please don't do that um but i know i i do, I do agree with you in the sense that they were really trying to bring that emotional heft to these scenes and it, and it didn't work to the extent to for me either um the G gamora death it really didn't mean that much to me honestly it was just okay this character's gone off screen i don't have to pay attention to her anymore and her relationship um you know with star lord as well like it felt a little bit forced to me like in the previous films i loved it their chemistry is great and not to say that it's not good in this but their connection in this movie there's like one kiss and then her promise, making him promise that he'll kill her if it comes down to it, it felt a little bit forced and it didn't totally work for me. Overall, it was fine, but like I was just waiting for it to get to the next thing. I, I'll agree with you in that respect. The one point where I really, really think that they did sell it, though, is in his reaction to finding out she dies, because I really think that Pratt like really pulls a great fucking performance out of his ass in that scene because like you can really you can really feel some emotionality from that character and for pratt who is you want to talk about jokesters he's like the jokester of the jokesters of all of this cast so i really feel like he sells that in that scene where like he's definitely pained you know by her death and yeah. i buy 
his reaction to finding out that she dies, that he's so blinded by rage and by grief that he fucks up like legit their one chance. Yeah, to their, get the their one off chance, of their whole entire plan. <laughs> like I buy that completely, and and that's all all kudos to Chris Pratt in that scene. I I really really oh, felt yeah, definitely. like that was a great scene. Speaking, I want to get into some of this stuff, Justin, because we haven't talked. I don't think enough about some of the action sequences in the film, and especially the powers of the infinity gauntlet in the, in the film. How awesome was it to see like the different powers of the infinity gauntlet, like realized I, I really, I really feel like, and I was worried about this, like going into the film. I'm like, well, he's got this thing that can do this and this and this and this and this. It can do all these things. I was like, how well are they going to utilize this? How well did you feel they utilized the infinity gauntlets, different powers in the film? I felt like a really, they did a really good job. I think with the amount of time they had with all the characters to juggle, you know, we had the different stones to deal with. They did a really good job with it. I think they were very creative with it. I mean, we have the space stone, we have the mind stone, it, uh, the reality stone, the power stone, the time stone, the soul stone. I mean, we had a bunch of things that they had to really work into the film. And I thought that it was pretty well done and it, when it gets to the level of fantasy this is this is what i want to see they took advantage of it and they really connected the dots from all the things that we saw in the previous films but i wish that we we got to see a little bit more of it maybe if the film was a little bit longer and they could have utilized it and we don't know what they're going to do in the next one i'm hoping that we get to see a lot more of it um but i thought it was fantastic the job they did with it and here's this is this is going to be the biggest the biggest issue that I have with this film, Justin, uh, is is a specific scene. And I've seen other people call this scene out as well. So I know I'm not alone here. And I I'm, I think that you'll actually be on my side with this one. But this film had a chance. It had a chance to really level its fucking audience emotionally to really kick us right in the fucking gut. And that's when Thanos stabs Stark. And oh you my God. get that you, you, moment. You nailed it. You oh, get that man. moment oh. where you're like, they're finally going to do it. Marvel is finally going to grow a pair. They're finally going to kill. Oh, no, wait. No, he's fine. It's what I wanted. I was it's what so I wanted. It's all I wanted, Nick. Mad, it's all dude. I wanted. Like, I mean, okay, Loki gets killed. But what's Loki really done since Avengers? Not much. Okay. They kill Gamora. She's an ensemble fucking member of the Guardians. Like, who really cares? And have we seen the last of those two characters? Who even knows? But Stark, the emotional center of this universe, the beginning of it all, the character that started it all. If the audience has a connection to any character more strongly, it's like maybe Cap, maybe. But Iron Man, Tony Stark is definitely like the core. When he gets fucking stabbed, like, dude, I got goosebumps. The hair is standing excited. up. I was excited. I was like, so happy. I was like tell me this is not really happening right now. Like they're, they're really finally going to do this. And this would have, I would have given this movie like a nine out of fucking 10, if that would have happened. And then no, they take it, they take it away. They snatch it away just as quickly as they give it to you. They, nah, gotcha. Nope. Sorry. Nope. We can't kill him yet. Nope. Do, do you know how angry I was? I was do you know how so upset mad. I was because as soon as he got stabbed, I was like, this is it. And, and I had done, not on the show, but I had talked to in person and at work and everyone kept asking me, who do you think's going to go? And I said, Loki's definitely going to go. And I said, I hope Iron Man. Well, you even said it last week on the show when we yeah. talked about what we wanted to see in this film. We talked about who we thought would die. And you were like, Stark needs to die. You said well, it he perfectly needs to. last week. And I think I, you I mean, were right. Because of the fact that it had that moment, it gave the opportunity, it provided it to us. And then it kind of took it away. I felt like I was fucking, uh, it was taking my money back from cheated. my admission that I, I paid to see cheated. the movie. I was cheated. Definitely. Like, why couldn't you have let him go? We've had him every single one of these movies, pretty much. Almost all of them. Okay. He, he's, he, he's, he's literally, dude, his course, he, he did it. He's done. He's gone. Like, and he was good in the movie. I loved him in the movie. And, and it would have even added more to it knowing that he's engaged. He's going to be married. You know, the whole thing with Pepper and everything like it was perfectly set up. Then you fucked up. No clue who made that decision. But whoever you are, you fucked up. I'm pissed at you for fucking that yeah. up. You ruined it. Was, it. it was absolutely terrible. And, and, and that for me, really, 
it, it's from that point forward where this film, even though it has some great action set pieces, the battle in Wakanda is amazing. Fantastic. Even though I want to know, Justin, what your thoughts are on this, because this was an interesting plot point I felt in the film as I'm watching it. Because in all the trailers, we saw the Hulk in Wakanda. But in the film... The Hulk's not in Wakanda. It's actually Banner in the Hulkbuster armor. The Hulkbuster armor, here's, yeah. Here's my question to you. Do you think that this was a decision made in marketing to swerve the audience? They put the Hulk in the trailers on purpose. Or do you think that this was a decision that was made at some point in production where they were like, no, let's add this subplot about the Hulk not coming out in this movie and let's quick scrub the Hulk out of the final battle and add Hulkbuster in instead. Like, which do you think that was? Because I think... I think that this probably was was conceptually planned more earlier, and I think that they swerved the audience a little bit. I think they put the Hulk in the Battle of Wakanda, because otherwise, if you think about it, he doesn't appear in the trailers at all. And then people would be like, where's Hulk? So if you just put Hulk in there... Yeah, because you, yeah, you, you can't, have, you can't have that. You can't have the imagery or any of the scenes from the cold opening of Hulk in there. Cause then you'll go, Oh my God, yeah. like Hulk fights Thanos. And that, that's, that's, I don't think that's anything they wanted to spoil. Yep. So I, I, I kind of agree with you. I didn't really think about that that much, except for, I was like, wait a minute. Like, why is he in the armor? Like that added a little bit of comic relief. That was fine for me. Um, to me, like banner was one of the least things that I cared about in this movie. Um, I love Ruffalo a lot, but some of his scenes, I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I felt like he was phoning it in or like not hitting his mark or they did like one take for him. I don't know. That's just me. Like cause some of the lines, wait, there's a Spider-Man and an Ant-Man. And then like, it's quiet and no one says anything. And the whole audience doesn't even laugh. I'm like, Oh, don't know what you're trying to do here. Um, but I think that was fine. I, I liked seeing him like trying to change and like struggling with it. It adds to that whole like, oh, well, it's not something that just turns on and off. I like that they're him. still playing with the struggle between the characters. They're yeah. continuing that from Thor Ragnar. And there's another actual moment in the trailers too, Justin, where you see Thor, they purposely erase the hammer that he makes. They make that axe, which was a great sequence. And how great is Peter Dinklage as a giant fucking dwarf, dude? Didn't Come even on. know he was going to be in it. Didn't oh my God. It. Like, I, dude, yep. cheers. That was from the great, audience dude. when he, what, when there he was jumped another on screen. moment in the film because of course, in Ragnarok, we realized that Thor doesn't need the, the hammer to summon his powers of lightning. And then in this film, it kind of, I don't want to say it retcons that, but it almost feels like it does a little bit because he, he can't, like summon his lightning powers until well, all of a sudden he has that hammer. I'm going to tell you though, I'm going to tell you that when he gets that ax at the end and the battle of Wakanda, when he jumps down and he just smashes out all those fucking dude, whatever awesome. those mindless aliens, I Badass. had goosebumps. That Badass literally fuck, was dude. the moment that I was hoping for in this movie where I was like, yep. this is the shit that I wanted to see. And it had me right there. It had me by the balls and it was pulling. Yep. Bad ass as fuck. Well, Justin, why don't we, because I don't want to run super long on this segment. Why don't we go ahead and jump into a quick break here? We're going to come right back, and then I want to get into a discussion about the ending of this film, because the ending of this film has drawn some controversy, and it's one of the biggest talking points, I feel, among people who have seen it. So I really want to get into the ending of this film, and then we'll talk about anything else that we want to talk about in our final thoughts. How's that feel? Sounds good. Let's Sounds good it. to me, man. So Let's we do will it. be right back. This week in epic film history. All right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go a little off the walls here. I'm gonna say Mad Max Fury Road. It takes place in Australia, and I love you, Paul and Wayne, but I'm a good old Foster's. Australian it's Australian for beer. For beer. I and apparently, according Mel to Mel Gibson, Australian for Jew hater. <laughs> Australian for anti-Semite. My number four, and nobody's mentioned this, and I doubt anybody is going to mention it. It's motherfucking Baywatch. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, that's what? I'm going to go see it. Two words. Two words. Alexandra Daddario. <laughs> I don't fucking Damn care. Right. She is He's fucking like my gorgeous personified, dude. Uh, come on, give us your best crocodile Dundee at least. Best, come on. My best, my best crocodile Dundee. Oh, look at that. We've got a beautiful saltwater crocodile. That's Crocodile Hunter. He's doing that's not, Crocodile that's Hunter. Crocodile Hunter, not Crocodile Hunter. Crocodile Dundee. Crocodile Dundee, <laughs> <laughs> crocodile Dundee is. Oh my god. That's not a knife. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a knife. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, so everybody oh, give me Lord. I got to see give me your best before sets. I can That's crocodile not Dundee guys. Come on. Oh, so you've played Knifey Spoonie before. <laughs> oh, hey. Yeah. Good stuff. Oh. Throw another shrimp on the bobby. <laughs> uh, to be Australian, you just got to talk like Mr. Sunday Movies. That's what everyone's exposure to Australia is anymore. The real question is, do you want to be in the middle or in the back? Do you want to be do you want to have your face buried in someone else's ass and someone else's face buried in your ass or would you rather just have your face buried in someone's ass. I'd rather be in the middle because, like, they could do me some favors back there, you know? I mean, I'd rather be in the front because I'm not about... No, 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 that's not an option. That is not an option here because clearly everyone would rather be in the front. <laughs> it's, the, it's the middle one and the last one. Which one out of those two would you pick? Then, yeah, the middle because I'm a douche. No, no, because... I kind of think the they, the they're both as bad as each other. Like... From it. Yeah. No, it's right, one of those but, things, but... like, if I'm gonna if I'm going to deal with it, I want someone else to have to deal with it with me. <laughs> that makes sense. It's a yeah, spite. I mean, it adds up, man. It's it adds spite. Hundred percent. <laughs> I mean, if you gotta go, if you gotta go out a shitty way, you might as well go out <laughs> fucking somebody else too. Uh, anyway. Listen, all I'm saying is I want someone to tongue punch my fart box, but I'm not unwilling to return the favor. <laughs> are, so are I'll take the middle one. Tongue punch you right are in the balloon. Are we all gonna knot? ignore the fact that Nick tongue kissed his mic a little bit ago? No, he was like. What were you shaft. doing to your mic? Were you were you sucking your mic? <laughs> I was just trying to accept <laughs> it. He was just yeah. thinking about me. He was me. not going to admit know. it. Yeah. Oh, no. gross. <laughs> there he goes. Do oh, it. Sexy. God. That cannot be unseen. <laughs> he loves sucking that mic. <laughs> oh, my God. Did you just get bored and just, like, start licking your mic? Caleb's deep throat. I've seen him right do now. this in other live streams as well. So. I've never <laughs> noticed that before. This is, this is not like, the first time it will over not and you be the just, last, I promise and you. And you just started fucking making out with your mic. Hot. <laughs> Sweet can. Well, you know when it's been a while. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for sticking with us here in our mini little break there and our review of Infinity War. We're jumping right back in here. We're going to talk about the ending of the movie. As Nick just said previously before we took this break, this is one of the most discussed points of the film where people are kind of up in arms. They're really either liking it, they're not liking it, they're hating it, they're confused by it. I know that my audience definitely didn't really necessarily know what was going on, and I can't really tell you enough. Maybe I don't even know what was going on in that scene. So, Nick, what were your initial thoughts on the ending? How did that movie leave you at the end of it? Fuck the ending of this movie. <laughs> Fuck the ending of this is movie. This, is this Nick's rant? Is this Nick's Str- rant? Is no, it close? No, I, I, I'm not no, going to reach about it just far? yet because I, I, okay, I just. Okay. But you know what? This carries off of the Iron Man swerve, Justin, because they already showed us that they didn't have the balls to kill off any of the main characters. And then all the rest of these characters are just snapped out of existence. With the one, you know, you could snap his fingers and half the life in the universe ceases to resist. Okay, that's fine. Whatever. But legit. In uh, it, 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 I can't as in it, it's something it, like as an audience member, as a film buff like I am, as somebody who knows film, who pays attention to film news and everything, you know that how many of these actors are still contracted to more sequels that are already announced for these characters. You know, none of these deaths are they, they mean nothing. All these characters are coming back, all of them, legit, all of them, except maybe Vision. I don't know how poor Vision's gonna fare. When he was looking I don't all, think I don't think Paul Bettany signed on for anymore. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know. I don't no. know how he's going to really make it uh, in the in the in the film there. But like legit, like dude, Black Panther disappears. All of the Guardians, but Rocket disappear. Like Bucky dude, Spider-Man disappears. Spider Man disappears. Spider Man disappears. And we know, know. and we know, have, we, and we know we have a Spider Man sequel know. on the way. So <laughs> all these characters are coming back. So it's really for me. It was like okay, I get what you're trying to go for. I understand it. But at the same time, to me, I can't, as an audience member, just watch that in the moment and try to like understand the gravity of it because I know it will be undone. And it ultimately has no thematic heft for me because I know that, because I just... I know it's meaningless. I They had their chance with Stark. They pussied out. They didn't have the balls to kill Tony Stark, just outright kill him in the movie. And then he doesn't even fade away at the end either. And then it's like, like, I just knew. What does that mean though? That's my question. I mean, is there more significance to this than leads to be seen? Like, do we think that there's a possibility that this does mean more than just, you know, the basic at face value that, Oh, they're just evaporating. Um, 
Is there a reason why the characters we're seeing that are staying that are not evaporating are staying versus the ones that are evaporating? You know, like I, that was what I was starting to question. I think that's maybe where they wanted to lead you. Like, hmm, I wonder why this person isn't like because, again, ladies and gentlemen, we don't read comics. We don't read current comics. I've read a comic since I was maybe mid 20s. I don't collect comics. So none of this shit matters to me that happened in the comics that relate to this story or this 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 series. So for me, I'm like, don't even mention the comics because none of that matters because film is not comics. Um, so I mean, when it comes to that, I'm like, I, I just I want to see how it works out in the next film and how it's going to affect the next handful of movies. Now, of course, we're going to get to the end 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 credit scene in a little bit there and where yeah, that yeah. leads us off. But um what does this mean for the world? What does it mean for all these heroes and their own solo stories? Like if they're just evaporating off, I mean, I don't, it didn't, it didn't necessarily work for me either. I thought it was an interesting idea. I thought visually it was fantastic. Visually it was fantastic. But you, and here's, here's, here's the other problem that I really have with it. None of the characters sell it. None of the characters that are still alive. I'm saying sell it. The only one that I really was like, like no, he's gonna fit, like with Spider Man because Holland really Holland knocked it out of the park in this fucking movie once again. Oh, he's great! I really he's fucking loved him in, in that, this. and he was the only one where I was really like, oh shit, even Spider Man. But like, like dude, like a lot of these other like these characters are disappearing, and you just have the rest of the characters that are just standing there like stone faced, just like, uh huh, oh shit, yeah. Like I mean, like, <laughs> and I think it's it's almost like they're telegraphing like. Uh, we know this is going to be undone too because we already shot the film back to back with the first one. So, <laughs> like, it, it do the just best face we can. Didn't have any thematic heft for me? Like I said, they brought in that cold open. I keep going back to that cold open because I think it was so perfectly executed to bring Thanos into this world. And then I think what the film kind of does as he accumulates more power in this film, Justin, as he accumulates more of the Infinity Stones, he almost becomes less effective of a villain for me a little bit because again well, let's let's get into him let's let's open it up right now because we've talked about a lot of other things but let's get into thanos at his core like as a villain because that's one thing that we've talked about for years is marvel not getting their villains right let's let's just jump right into thanos himself his portrayal the performance how he looked overall i loved uh, brolin's voice acting was on point i loved the visual look of the character I even love that fucking Star Lord was making fun of his nut sack chin. <laughs> I, I laughed my ass off. I, that. I laughed. That, that was, was one really, really I good line. I liked that was that. really really good. And you know, I I loved, I loved kind of that inherent menace uh, to the character. Now, do I necessarily think that they needed to give him the motivation of, well, there's too there's too many people, there's too many beings in the universe, so we need to balance out the skills because there's just too many beings. I don't necessarily think they needed to give him that motivation, to be quite frank. I feel like they could have just been like, he hates life and he just wants to end half of the life in the universe. Like, I really, really feel like they could have just left it at that. I don't think they needed to add the whole. Yeah, if he, oh, if he hated life, then he wouldn't be a relatable villain. So yeah, like, I think they wanted you to be able to relate to him a little bit because there are those moments that you are supposed to be able to emotionally connect with him. Um, you know, we do see the main villain, this almighty powerful Thanos, we see him tear up. We see him cry in the movie. Yeah. Um, and you know, the tear rolls down. I think if you section. wanted that stuff to be more effective, <laughs> then you need to sell the Gamora Thanos relationship harder in the film. And as much as I love that cold open, I think you have to start the film with a flashback, almost the, the, the flashback of him first getting Gamora. Like, I think if you want that, that emotionality to that character. I think if you want the audience to connect to him more, you need to open with that scene almost because it's him being kind of tender with this little girl who's scared, who's afraid. And meanwhile, half the population of her planet is getting mowed down in the background before you get into anything else. The way that they introduce him in the film, he immediately comes in, he beats the ever loving fuck out of one beloved character and completely kills another one. You know, and has completely killed pretty much the entire what's right. left of the Asgardians. So you immediately set him up on that like really dark villainous note, which I loved, which was fantastic. But it doesn't from that point forward, I can't emotionally connect to that character after that, no matter what you do in flashbacks to try to bring me back around to that point. I think you right. I think you lead the film with that flashback. Maybe you have a better shot at it. 
or you I even agree. spend I know, I know, more I... time developing the Thanos Gamora relationship through flashbacks or just have them spend longer together in the film before she ends up dying. You know, I, I, know I don't what know. You mean. I, I wouldn't have ever changed anything for that cold open because as you said earlier on, and I it's totally so agree perfect. with you, it's the so cold perfect. open is perfect. And then it jumps into the New York battle. Then it jumps into the battle with, with, um, vision and scarlet witch and we get to see cap jumping and, and black widow and everything and like everything is perfectly put together now a lot of people were complaining about the pacing in this movie i found it to be pretty good i think they balance things out there are some moments that are like i said they get a little slow but i'm fine with that because then when i get to the action sequences i think it builds up perfectly to that well, there's some um, there's some baller ass action sequences in this film and we haven't talked amazing about, action sequences. we haven't talked about amazing. all of them but we can talk about uh, the battle on Titan between you got Iron Man there, Spider Man, Doctor Strange is there, Star Lord, uh, Nebula's there, and uh, Drax and Mantis, I think her name is. Yeah, Mantis. That's right. That's correct, Mantis. You've got all these characters trying to fight against Thanos, trying to get the fucking gauntlet off of them. And dude, Thanos throws a fucking moon at them at one point. Like, I know, I mean, dude, dude, right? There was some right? <laughs> baller ass fucking action God. going on in this movie. And we already mentioned, of course, the Wakanda battle. Amazing to see Chadwick Boseman come back as that character. Just as soon as they got back there, I immediately just got reminded of Black Panther and how much I, I love that movie. Dude. And like, there's so much amazing stuff about this, but I'm going to, I'm going to throw this one at you, Justin. I'm going to throw this okay. one at you real quick. Let's get it. Let's get Not it. enough cap. I, I can agree with you. Not um, enough Cap for me. I mean, for me, but Cap's I, my favorite MCU character, so that might just be me. But I can agree with you. I don't you. feel um, like you I, get I, as much of him as you get as a, a lot of the other characters. I'll tell you right now, the the, the cool thing that about these movies is, and the way the Russos uh, perfected this movie is that these are characters we've seen through and throughout these films. Okay, it's not like it's been years since we've seen them, but they perfectly put together this movie where. A scene where you introduce Cap again, the crowd cheers. You're excited again. Oh, my God. I mean, I saw him two movies ago, but, oh, my God, I'm seeing him again. This is so awesome. And the same thing with Black Panther. I'm like, I just saw him a few months ago. When we get to Wakanda and you hear the, you, you know, hear the Black Panther theme and then he shows up, you're like, oh, my God, I'm excited. Goosebumps. You know, you I got all that. From this movie, even when Thor comes down, like I said, with his axe, all these moments, these are the characters I keep seeing over and over again. So they're not fresh and new. It's like I've been seeing them over and over. They they calculated everything out perfectly to make give you that feeling like, oh, man, yeah. it's been years and stuff. So, you, know, you know what I mean? I get what you're saying with Cap. Um, I have a feeling he's going to serve more of a purpose now. I'm going to mention this as well. Of course, well. because they thinned out the herd. So now you've only got so many left. But for me, it was going to be either Stark or Rogers that was going to go. I was hoping one or the other would go because, I mean, I, I, I love, I'd rather have Cap. I like Cap more. Um, But I was hoping that one of them would go because that would have been that moment that said, oh, shit. Oh, man, they're not fucking around. They're really going to take out one of our favorites. They're going to take one of the strongest leaders of this group. But again, I think what they're trying to connect for uh, later film, the, the next film, I should say, not later film, but um, is that 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 relationship with Stark and Cap when they're like, we're not talking like maybe they're going to meet up one last time before one of them. Of gets course off. they are. I don't know. That scene's definitely yeah. coming in Avengers 4. We know it is because they still kept those two groups for the most part from Civil War separated. So you didn't really get to see them interacting together. So. Yeah, I think that's I, you get to see Rhodey in there, War Machine, Don Cheadle, you know, it, it, which is great. You know, it, great to see him as well. Anthony Mackie was amazing in the film as Falcon. Scarlett Johansson was great in the film as Black Widow, but they were a little bit more of your B team. I will say I was glad to not see Renner show up in this. I didn't know he wasn't going to be in it, um, but Dude, a I lot think of people made were... sense. <laughs> You saw all those posters, right? Like all the fan posters before the movie came out where they were adding Hawkeye to the poster or they had Hawkeye posters for just him on it with Infinity War. And yeah. I'm like, guess what? I don't really care because it's not a character I give a fuck about. No offense. Yep. I, I have a newfound appreciation for Jeremy Renner. Um, but at this point, I, I'm like, dude, the character was never that interesting to me. I'm glad he wasn't yeah. in it. I don't care. And of care. course, Ant-Man was very notable in his absence as well. But it makes sense that he's not in it because... 
if you if you have him in this film, just from a, an MCU standpoint, and this gets into world building stuff, which gets almost a little bit annoying. But if you have Ant Man in this film, you can't have Ant Man and the Wasp without having a huge discussion about this film. Although, if I'm not mistaken, isn't uh, Ant Man supposed to take place before Infinity War? Ant Man and the Wasp. I mean, I, I believe it. I believe, I believe it is. It yes. does because um, we know, and I guess well, we got to get there, Justin. We've got to get to the post credit sequence here we are but there's one scene that i wanted to talk talk oh, to you it, about real quick it. that i wanted to yep. that i wanted to highlight one of my favorite little parts of the action sequences is at the end of wakanda where we see scarlet witch we see black widow and we see a koi from wakanda fighting that is it a female villain i think so that a fe- whatever they, they should have never done that character i don't know what the character's name that is black swan looking children. motherfucker that's they all I should can think have of never. Aronofsky's Black Swan with that like thin band of black makeup around the eyes. Dude, they should have. Why? Please tell me why the fuck they made that character all CG. It looked like a computer I, game or a, I, a, a video game know. character. I'm like, but, but seriously, it looked awful. Um, they could have easily done that practical or cast easily. someone physically. But when you have Akoya and you have Scarlet Witch and Black Widow all fighting that character, all three of the most badass female heroes we have. It was amazing, dude. That was one of my favorite scenes because yeah, that, that fight scene was awesome. It was very sequence. short, but I love that they threw that in there, and I love we got to see that on screen. Yeah, that was absolutely amazing. And, of course, we got to see – I love that we got to see uh, T'Challa's sister come back in the film as well. She was trying to remove the, the Mind Stone from his head, from Vision's head, which was really, really nice. So it was great to see her come back. They really did at least spend some time focusing on the badass women that are in this as well. Uh, poor Nebula, who – you know, poor Amy Pond. God, I love she her. Does, she does some. Ki- she does some kicking ass. She, she kicks some ass she in kicks, the movie. Though. She comes amazing. back with I a vengeance. I love her, and I love the character of Nebula. For as much as I dislike the Guardians movies, I really think the character of Nebula has grown very well over the course of those two films and into this. I really, really think she's taken some major strides, and I love seeing her in this film. And you know what? The best part is, is when she goes to face Thanos on titan you can like she's a great actress i love karen jillian but you can feel, you can the feel that dude in that yeah, character you can feel how much she hates thanos and that's what i love about that and you know i mean there's there's certain scenes in the film there's certain performances in the film where they sell that better than others but you know overall I, like it's, i don't i don't want to shit on this film too much because there were too many great things about it there were too many things that i was like just inside i got all warm and tingly it was just amazing to see it was such a beautiful amazing spectacle it was a special event no matter how much anybody would like to try to deny it it was a special event 10 fucking years 18 movies in an interconnected universe we've never seen something like this before justin ever so and we'll never see it again it I don't was think. i really don't amazing it really really was but I think it could have been better. And I think it could have been better if this didn't feel like it was. And somebody else said it, and, and they'll have to forgive me. I don't know who it was. Somewhere when I was reading uh, reactions and thoughts and whatever. But basically, this film still feels like a part one, even though they scrubbed the part one off the title. This originally was supposed to be Infinity War parts one and two. And then they, they took That's the part correct. one off. They just made this Infinity War because the Russos are like, no, no, no. The next one is so much of a different film and maybe it is we haven't seen it yet so we don't know that but this film still feels like too much of a part one it still feels like it's it's just too much you know it left too much undone for me yeah. when i walked out but it also it did lead me to like get excited for the next one and i haven't been quote unquote actually excited for a marvel movie in a while now we get them all the time we've complained about it we've talked about it a lot on the show but I know where you're coming from here. This movie could have easily been better than what it was. And I get it, ladies and gentlemen. I've seen all the social media reactions. I've seen it through in and throughout the past couple of days. Best comic book movie ever. Best Marvel villain ever. Best this ever. Best that ever. It's the, you know, And it, it literally just broke records. So it is the biggest thing ever. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for me, I've been there along with you this this past 10 years. I've watched all these movies and you got me to a point where you could have had me at, yeah, this would have been one of the best. And I still think it is in, in in the talks, but you should have killed Stark. You should have raised the stakes a little bit higher and you should have lessened the jokes, man. You would have had me 100%. Um, I'm almost there, but not quite. So for me, that's what's going to lead me off to 
my rating of the film. All right. Before we get to our final ratings, we do have to talk about the post credit sequence in this film because, of course, we get to see uh, Colby Smulders and fucking old Nick Fury himself. Even They even had to get Samuel Jackson in there, almost saying motherfucker, just because it's Samuel Jackson. I know. Jackson. Loved it. God damn it. I still love it. But of course, <laughs> they both fade away, but not before he punches something into some weird ass looking motherfucking thing. And then, of course, we see the insignia pop up, boom, across the screen. And we know what it means, Justin. Captain fucking Marvel. And we know we have Captain Marvel coming in 2019. It's going to be set in the 90s. March. Yeah, it's yep. March 2019. So, That's right. Uh, Brie Larson is going to be Captain Marvel. So it's going to be. I don't I don't know. I, have you seen the photos, the the onset photos that were released yep. today of Sam, young Sam Jackson? Man, did they de-age him? He looks great. Yeah. Holy shit! So I, I I I don't know just yet. I don't, I don't know just yet because I know that movie is going to bring back a lot of like it's going to bring back Ronan the Destroyer. Oh boy, sign me up for that. But your favorite, your favorite. Yeah, who knows? But you know, it, it's um, it, it leaves us in that kind of place where, you know. She's a very, very powerful character, and is she going to kind of be the one to turn the tide in Avengers Four, and and kind of bring this thing to a conclusion? You know, is is she going to show up and just have an immediate effect, or how exactly are they going to go about it, or are they going to still have to fight Thanos? What's going to happen with all that stuff? I don't know. There's a lot of different directions I think they can go in with a part four, um, but we know we know that they're going to undo. What ha- were they? We, they're going to undo the snap. The ending. They're going to undo yeah, it. The ending is, the ending yeah. isn't going to have uh, the heft that it should have. And again, that's I, I can't say enough. And I, I I hate to repeat myself so much, which I do all the time on the show. But it's you had me. You had us both. You know, you had a lot of people, and some people it worked for them, and I totally get that. And I love you for. I would have been fucking that. loving, and dude. I probably even would have cried if Stark would have fucking died in the theater. But then, I was almost there, dude. I was almost there, but then like the way the scene, the way the scene played started to play out, mm. the way that it was staged, I'm like, oh no, they're not gonna. Oh wait, no, they're 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 oh they're not gonna do it. Yep. They're it's, not gonna. They didn't do it. And then like for five minutes, I'm sitting there going, they didn't fucking do it. I even turned to Danielle. I was like, they should have killed him. And she just like looked at me and shrugged her shoulders. And I'm like, <laughs> that was the one moment I wanted. And it's not because I'm sick of Stark. I mean, maybe it is. I, it kind of is, but, but at the same time, that, that would been have been that one moment. The emotional gut punch that this film needed. Number one, <sighs> it's it's not that I don't think Thanos is an amazing villain. It's not that I don't think he's a super badass villain, but that that would have been his Kylo Ren stabbing Han Solo moment. Like that would have been the moment where you really elevate him that much further and really put him over as a villain. I really think that, that was what you needed to put him 100% over. I will say, I will say this, however, and I mentioned this when I talked about homecoming last week, cause I watched it. I loved that basically for all intents and purposes, Justin, he was basically swatting flies the whole time. The Avengers were a fucking joke to him the whole time because he's so powerful. I really did love that about him. And even when they all worked together, they still couldn't fucking beat him. They still couldn't. They just him, yeah. he just plowed his way through everybody and just beat the fuck out of them. And I love But I did love that one moment at the Go end ahead. there, you know, they destroy the mind stone, he's not gonna be able to complete the gauntlet, and then he just brings that fucking gauntlet up. Boink. And fucking rewinds time and then just fucking plucks that stone right out of fucking Vision's head. Dude, it's so great. So, so fucking yeah. great. And, like, you could just, like, I, I really, really think that Brolin's performance as that character and yeah. that the CG animation that they did and the work that they did in realizing Stellar that character job. was incredible. Stellar job. Absolutely incredible. Loved the design. Loved all the work they yeah. did with that. Really incredible. There were maybe a, a, a tiny few moments and the entire film where I said this didn't look good, the rest of it looked stunning. It looked beautiful. No. Um, if you haven't seen the film yet, you shouldn't have listened to this. But if you have seen the film <laughs> and you want to see it again and you haven't seen it and you want to see it again, if you have seen it, if you've seen it, you want to see it again. Find if you have the opportunity. Find the see largest it. format theater you can. Large format. And see it. Large fucking format. Don't see it at yeah, the yeah. AMC like I did. <laughs> I, I might I might go see it at Airbus again, Nick. I'm debating. Yep. I want it to slow down a little bit before I do, because I know th- there's still lines at that place for this thing. Oh, yeah. This thing's not slowing down, man. That box office is only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's going to just fucking 
be a gigantic juggernaut. It's going to be the biggest movie of the year. I'm telling Easily. you right now. Easily. But Solo is not going to touch it for, by any means. Nope, you nope, think if nope. it were like a main line Star Wars release, maybe, but no, nah, not even close. But so, Marvel has proved, Disney has proved yeah. with their formula, it's working great. They're not going to change it up. So let's get to it, Nick. Let's move on right now as we finish up the show. Let's get to our ratings. We did have... Some people over in the Hopesters Dumpster, our they fan did. group on Facebook, that speculated what our our ratings would be. All right, and I'm I'm not how even close gonna, are they? I'm not even going to pull them back up, but I will go first, Justin, and I will say I'm going to slap a seven out of ten on it. I knew it. Just, I just a seven out of ten on it. I still really yep. enjoyed it. I couldn't lower it to a six because I felt like six was just taking too much away from the film. But I think that there are certain aspects of this film, especially taken away that stark death scene that to me taking that away was a bigger gut punch than giving me the death scene would have and it was the wrong kind of gut punch you know i really think that they had the chance to really make thanos he was a great villain don't get me wrong i really loved him for the most part but you had a chance you had a chance to really really put him over as a villain and i just don't think they did it and yeah i've, I've got to go with a seven out of ten on it Okay, that's I'm not surprised. It's rare that you shock me anymore, but yep, I'm going to jump up one point. Like you said earlier, I'm going to give it an eight out of ten. I knew this would have been a nine for me, maybe even maybe even a 10 if you had to made some changes because everything else like we talked about was fantastic. You had those action sequences. You had intertwined action sequences that were happening at the same time and you went back and forth between them and they were done perfectly where it kept the energy. It kept the tension. You had a great villain. You should have killed Stark. I'm telling you it, that would have given you another point. There it is. Um, but for real though, eight out of 10, I thought it was very good. I thought it, it's still one of the best, um, as far as from a filmmaking standpoint, the way that it was written, the way that it juggled. I mean, what other movie juggles that many characters and does it that well? Yeah. That many main characters that we've already seen in their own solo movies. Russo's are the people to have do these movies. Have them do as many of these as you can yeah. while you still have them. Um, yeah, keep so there the it Russo's is. on your payroll. And ladies and gentlemen, we do have a winner. How dare you? No, Paul, it's you. It's you. You won. Paul actually guessed 100% correctly. Eight for you, seven for me. Um, I think Jared and Dan were maybe just maybe because they know I'm a little bit more. I'm a little harsher on films than you are for the most part. And I think they really expected uh, me to go that much lower. So, nope, I did not go six. I had to go seven. I just loved like that cold open. Honestly, that cold open is probably like six of my seven points. It's that good. It sells this film. It sets up this film that well. And I just think that you could have gotten there if, if they would have cut out a little bit of the humor, kill Stark. I, and a little of the humor. You know what? Kill, kill out a lot of the humor. even. You know what? Even I wouldn't have even minded the ending as much if they would have killed Stark. If they would have killed somebody that really was... I, and, and I hate to say this, but if they would have killed somebody who mattered Meant something, who <laughs> I mean, for real, ultimately, I love Gamora. <laughs> I do. I find she's a great character, but like, ultimately, like, she's not a Captain America. She's no, not an Iron she's Man. She's not an Iron Man. She's you not know, even a Thor. She's not. She's not a major, major character yeah. in this entire universe you she's needed, not even a black widow yeah okay you needed to kill somebody who really fuck have him kill pepper fuck to have him not even kill one of the avengers have him kill pepper and have <laughs> iron man completely lose right his before, fucking right shit. before their wedding yeah there you go Whatever. that's what i'm talking about like do I hate to be that guy but like, seriously he needed to do seriously. something sick and wicked and sinister and he didn't do it and it was just man it, it, and if i'll say this justin it, it, they'll never have the balls now if they Never. didn't have the balls this is here, the opportunity. if they didn't have the that balls the here in the most perfect moment of this film to do it, they're never going to do it. Never. Nope. And even if they do, even if they do, it won't mean as much. It won't have that emotional yeah. weight that it should have in this movie because it had so. it had it perfectly. It led up to it perfectly for some reason. I don't. We could talk about it at a later time, maybe down the road. Was it perfect? Was it planned to have him go and they decided last minute to not? I don't know. We'll never I, know. Yeah. Maybe we will, but I don't know. It's anybody's, it's anybody's it. guess, That's but it. that is it. Ladies and gentlemen, that is 
Infinity War, and that's going to be like so. Basically, you know, if if you follow the timestamps of the episode, you're basically not listening to most of it. <laughs> see, yeah, this I film. any of it. Definitely a huge <laughs> recommendation from both of us to see this film, even though it does have its issues. Uh, so please get out there to the cinema and check it out. Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, we can't say it enough. Frankly, live stream for the cure 2.0 from today is just a little bit over two weeks. And Justin, I actually wanted to mention this up top and I forgot about it, but happy anniversary, buddy. You realize that the amazing Spider-Man two came out May 2nd of 2014. Oh my God. The Epic film guys are officially four fucking years old, buddy. How about that? Four fucking years. We've been doing this crazy shit. We went and saw that it was, in midnight yeah. showing. You had oh a my cord. God plugged into nothing coming out of your backpack attached to a microphone <laughs> we stood in line at dixon city imax and talked to people about the film and it was the first ever review that we ever did for the epic film guys it was amazing and man it's been it's been a hell of a fucking ride dude it's been a hell of a ride. i meant to mention it up top and i completely forgot about it but i could not let the show go out this show will land on may the third uh yeah may 2nd 2014 is when the amazing spider-man 2 came out so and it's crazy to think that in yeah. four years we've seen a new cinematic spidey in two different movies right. since then that is, crazy. that is really fucking crazy to think of it's amazing to think of 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 the ride that we've gone on and all the things that we've seen all the things that we've talked about all the things that we've done as part of this show as part of the video show that we used to do and so much bigger and better things on the horizon so we got to do it justin just for us here we go We get the smattering, baby. We we get the smattering for once because we never get it. We always give it to people, but we never get it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very, very much. Hey, try not to suck any dick on the way through the parking lot. I don't think that was called for. I wasn't going to suck anybody's yeah. dick. I wasn't going to. I don't like talking about that. I, no I don't idea. like thinking about it. I don't even know what the hell's yeah. going on here. But that's going to do it for us here on the Epic Film Guys podcast tonight, ladies and gentlemen. You're amazing. Every single one of you out there who's got us plugged into your ear holes, plugged into your car stereo, plugged into wherever, into your fleshlight, (laughs) to your frog fleshlight. Your your old boombox, if it has an aux cable, if you rewired some old boombox from like 1987 and you're listening to it on that, that'd be great. If you somehow recorded the show over onto an old fucking eight track tape and you're plugging this in. (laughs) I mean, I don't even think you'd fit a whole episode that we do on one eight track tape. You'd probably have to put it on like four, maybe. If you if you, if you took the whole digital track and put it onto a vinyl and you sold it with a Mondo cover with great artwork on it, there you go. That's what we need. Two, That's two what people we would buy need. it. E F G vinyl, <laughs> baby. But yeah, you guys are absolutely amazing. Justin, anything to say before we roll out the show? I love you guys. I love you, Nick. Here's the four years. I don't I have any more beer left because I drank it all. Night. Now, why here, do you have to, to bring the... that kind of thing in here and ruin here, here. the great mood of the show? Here's to the last sip of my How Now Brown Cow Milk Stout. There's one little tiny sip. I'm just going to sip it in celebration. And then I'm going to go watch Hell either Can't Hardly yes. Wait or 10 Things I Hate About You. Maybe or four years. She's all that. The <laughs> epic film, guys. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. It's been a crazy, crazy ride. And just to think, the podcast will be three years old in just a couple of months. So absolutely amazing. We actually, I did an interview. I forgot to mention so much stuff up at the top of the show uh, for the Binghamton university newspaper, the arts and culture section, uh, a girl that writes for the arts and culture section, found our podcast somewhere and reached out to us, asking us questions about the live stream for the cure and about the podcast. And that was super fun. I have no idea what happened to that because I sent her back the answers and I haven't heard from her since. So I don't know. But we'll see. Is we going to get our pictures in the newspapers? Jesus, God, I hope not. We've got some we've got some terrible photos of us floating around. Up. <laughs> Whoa. No, fantastic. I'm so glad that they reached out to us. Yeah, that was uh, absolutely amazing. It was really, huge really honor. nice. So, uh, yeah, just everybody out there, we appreciate everything that you guys do uh, to promote the show. Please, please, please get over to livestreamforthecure.com. Make that early donation or set your calendars for the 18th of May, 18th through the 20th, live stream for the cure, 2.0, raising $5,000 for the Cancer Research Institute for myself, for 
the god of podcasting himself, A1 Loy Choss, Loy Sauce, Steak Sauce, A1 Steak Sauce. L -l -l -loy sauce. That guy right there, and for that beautiful tattooed motherfucker on the screen right there. Thank you all very, very much for listening, and... Hey, motherfuckers. We'll see you <laughs> at the movies. <laughs> Like it at oddfixnetwork.com.